Hello and welcome to our Air and Sea Flip 2. This is going to be talking about air masses and how they interact with each other around the planet. Most air masses are actually created on the ocean because the ocean makes up 71% of the surface of the earth. Um, what I want my kids to do is to draw a basic idea of what this stuff is and if you take a look at it, the blue, these are all happening at r relatively high latitudes in the northern hemisphere so they all have a relatively cool temperature. Uh, cooler, much cooler if it actually happens during the winter like this CA, this arctic air mass. Uh, this is what brings in those uh, single digits down here to Virginia uh, when we experience in the summer. Uh, it, temperatures are not quite as cold, maybe 70 degrees, so winter temperatures really cold and summer temperatures really nice. And then the red ones down here, these are relatively warm, and again, summer temperatures are going to be high, winter temperatures not quite as high. So if we get a 70 degree temperature in January, February, probably because it came out of this Gulf of Mexico. What I want my kids to understand are the breakdown. If you take a look at all the ones up here, uh, these are actually P's for polar. A actually stands for an Arctic air mass, just tells you it's more polar than polar. M starts for maritime, so this is going to be a moist, cold air mass. There's another MP, moist, cold air mass. This is a C, which forms over land. Uh, it's still going to be cold. It's coming over Canada, but it's going to be a dry air mass where you may actually get moisture coming in to cause uh, fronts and storms. This one usually is going to bring you nice blue skies but cooler temperatures. Same thing down here. Put an M in front of it, you get what's called a maritime tropical. So it's coming up as warm. It also is coming up as wet. Notice they actually describe the dry and wet before they describe the cold and warm. I'm um, not sure exactly why they do that. Other than the fact that if you have a wet air mass, regardless of temperature, you have a better chance of a storm coming in. But these are the air masses that primarily affect the United States, or at least the North American continent. And I do want them to draw and have some idea about those air masses. Oh, there's one more thing. Air Zuka. Air Zuka, um, I've actually shown the kids uh, where I put a cologne or perfume squirt in here and I shoot it across the room. And what they really do is they these characteristics that come out of this air mass keep these characteristics so it stays cold. They will warm up a little bit, but they're going to stay colder than normal as they come down, just like warmer than normal, drier than normal, wetter than normal as they move. But this is a really good way of doing that. If I showed you a video really quickly, uh, it's a stupid video, Air Zuka, um, but it's got a neat little thing. It actually shows you that the air does move. You're the target? No, you are double Zuka. So notice she's got smoke inside of there, and as she pushes play, she's pulling back a, uh, an elastic bubble, and when it comes shooting out, it should come out with that smoke, and that smoke will travel as far as that air mass travels. And that's all I wanted to show. Okay, let's go to slide two. This is regional winds and storms. These are ones that are going to affect large areas of the continent, just not global. We don't really have any global storms on this planet. Um, luckily, we don't have it. So if you take a look at it, mid-latitude-like cyclones, these happen not in the tropics, not on the poles, but the mid-latitudes. Um, all these storms actually start with low pressure. I've got a red L in all these pictures. Uh, so they start with a low pressure. They're usually with uh, red L, so low, but the red is actually showing you that this is a relatively warm section. Uh, we have what's called the cold front, when cold air actually takes over warm air, producing cumulus clouds, lots of rain. Um, I do want them to draw these two um, as I explain it. Lots of rain, you may get thunder and hail depending on the vertical development. That's what we had uh, yesterday, but when you get a thunderstorm warning, it's a cold front moving in. Uh, what happens normally is, and actually let me show you this one, I'm going to click it because uh, it's just coming pretty quick. I wish it wasn't a black circle while it's doing it. still is taking its time. But um, basically what happens is we get cold air moving over. So as the front passes, uh, winds change direction, temperatures get colder, and the air mass gets heavier. So we get a high pressure center with the cold air. Uh, when a low pressure comes through, and I really wish this thing would open up, and I don't know why the cold front takes so long. When I click the warm front, it'll happen much faster. Um, when warm front comes through, uh, here we go. Okay, so... Let me pause this. So if you take a look, we have warm air mass. Um, we have cold air. Cold air being more dense 
is underneath it. It bulldozes its way through, and as it bulldozes it through, it takes this warm air and throws it up. Anytime you put air up, it cools. Anytime the air cools, it condenses, and you get this nice cloud format. And if you watch this thing form, you'll actually see... Let me shut this thing off. You see these clouds pop up. These are um, vertically developed clouds, cumulus clouds puffy, and eventually it's a cumulonimbus cloud as it rains. Uh, it doesn't show you thunder or hail, but we get lots of lightning and thunder in this picture as well, and it keeps progressing across, and eventually what will happen is the warm air is lifted off the planet and you have just this cool air mass. Okay, so let's go back into here. Warm air masses are exactly the opposite, where you've got cold air and warm air moves in, but the warm air can't push the cold air, so what it does, it wedges up, and instead of getting a vertically developed set of clouds, you get this gently rising, where you get more what are called stratus clouds. Instead of cumulonimbus, it's called stratonimbus clouds, so they're raining clouds, and you may get really thin uh, cirrus clouds up here as well. If I click warm front, opens much faster. <laughs> well, it does until I take the video. But the warm front is going to be exactly the opposite. You're sitting here under cold air or cool air, and the warm air goes up. It can't really push the cold air out of the way as quickly, and the air rises up. It condenses, makes these nice clouds. You get more stratus clouds, and you may get nimbostratus as it rains, but you're going to get the formation of cirrus clouds, those thin, wispy ones up here as well. Um, and it's not near as quickly. It rains for days, maybe two days, three days here, uh, where the cumulus red cl uh, cold front may be 15 20 minutes of rain you may get the same amount of rain one or two inches that you get in 15 minutes where in this front you get it in uh, hours and days okay uh, they are usually associated with lows in fact they're always associated with lows if you look at a map they actually have this uh, they start out as a nice straight line but what happens is the cold air starts diving it gets this counterclockwise spin low is located where it spins it makes this nice comma shaped clouds where we get the warm front located up here and then the cold front comes through with thinner uh, cumulus type clouds and moves through the next slide is actually an animation and if i hadn't played it already uh, notice that it's here it would have started out as a straight line uh, stationary front which has these teeth on both sides red on the top and blue on the bottom and eventually the cold air starts to sink cold fronts are actually shown with blue for the temperature and these sharp teeth because they're more tend to be more violent warm fronts warm air not as violent uh, much longer rain no real thunder or lightning lots of thunder lightning and hail this is day one and notice that the low actually progresses it's a nice beautiful counterclockwise spin at this location the cold front moving faster than the low front catches up and lifts the warm air up off the planet it's called an occluded front so the warm air has been occluded blocked out from the surface of the world um, this is day too so it's progressing across remember we live in the westerlies so our storms come primarily from the west and it spins over and eventually becomes day three and makes it off the planet and then are off the continent and it actually shows nice blue skies again and there's probably another one forming off here off the coast of uh, california or up here in canada or down here in the gulf of mexico which will bring in the next storm every two to three days we have what are called tropical cyclones, so not mid-latitude. These are actually tropical. They're close to the equator. They're going to be heavily developed um, by Coriolis effect. Um, they develop over tropical oceans. They need like 80 degree temperature water. Uh, 82 degrees is, is the best. So we need lots of water, and we need a stirring Coriolis effect spinning of the storm. You can see these yellow lines down here spinning. I do want them to draw this picture. Um, the hurricanes are in the easterlies, the trade winds, instead of going this direction, they start out going this way, and then eventually as they get higher up in latitude, the westerlies take over and it spins back out in the ocean. Um, but by the time they hit land, the, the water's cut off, and that's its biggest supply. You also need lots of condensation, so you need water vapor moving up into it, for, uh, moving up and cooling and making clouds, and as they condense, they lose the heat that made them vapor, and the heat actually causes more convection driving the, f the wind up um, which pulls more water into it and it's just a like a feeding frenzy and it's just a bunch of thunderstorms all together all spinning in a counterclockwise direction as the air uh, moves around the hurricane it moves up 
in the low and then eventually it works out and then the top of the hurricane actually spins in a clockwise direction even though the storm is a counterclockwise um, lots of clouds in this area lots of high wind lo lots of high surf um, the eye you do get cooler air r falling down if you ever watch the uh, movie um, uh, I forgot the name of the movie, but they have a helicopter in the eye and it actually freezes the liquid and they find out that it's like minus 100 degrees Celsius temperature to get the jet fuel to, to uh, form. Uh, I don't remember the name of the movie. You guys will. So we need a warm ocean, at least 82 degrees. We need moist air rising and condensing creating more heat and more convection and we need Coriolis effect to get this thing to spin so we we need lots of this stuff so you can see cool dry air falling you have what's called the eye you have spiral bands inside the hurricane and you have this warm water vapor which is rising and condensing and I do want them to draw that diagram a better diagram is sort of this one and if you take a look you can see the moist air coming in you can see thunderstorm after thunderstorm in fact it's a band of thunderstorms and as it goes up and then it moves in a nice clockwise direction uh, what it does cause is a negative pressure in here as this air is rising and you have a positive pressure out in this location so the air is pushing down on the water here it's not pushing as high here and what happens is we get what's called a storm surge um, it's sort of like it pushes the water up it's trying to pull the water up into the sky just like it did the air but it's a lot more dense and it's this storm surge as the hurricane hits land that causes all the flooding and most of the death death this is actually hurricane michael um, back from uh, 2003 or 4 and you can see it's got an eye you can see those nice uh, clockwise spinning bands on the top um, beautiful white color reflecting lots of sunlight beautiful cumulus clouds um, but all the action is actually going on down here in the ocean where it's pulling in this water vapor in a counterclockwise flow um, that actually is feeding all these clouds here's a, a picture of a tornado and a hurricane I'll show you a tornado first because it's sort of like a mini hurricane and basically what you get is you get air going across the surface and you get air up on above the surface the air down below is actually friction with the land so it's weaker wind and you get stronger wind and as we play what happens is you get this clockwise flow and then as this clockwise flow gets uplifted because of convection uh, what you end up getting is this counterclockwise storm and that is what causes your her uh, your tornado um, and it actually is the same thing, cumulus clouds um, pulling material up. So it's not pulling up water, it's pulling up debris, debris. And here's a hurricane, sort of the same thing. Um, we get this counterclockwise flow, and then the air actually starts moving up into the hurricane. So those are the spiral bands. And eventually, there we go, we start moving up into the hurricane in a counterclockwise flow. And it just feeds this. We do need high level winds to pull the air out that actually allows it to go up a lot faster and then there's the eye of the storm which is actually wa water uh, vapor going down which re can, uh, evaporates and makes a nice clear sky although if you were in the eye I'm not sure you could see all the way out okay Tropical cyclones happen in the tropics. Uh, this is the Tropic of Capri uh, Cancer up here. This is the Tropic of Capricorn. So they're usually forming. Our hurricanes come off Africa and they come in this direction. Uh, they also come off South America this direction. They're also down here. Um, notice that our hurricanes go in a different direction than the southern hurricanes and that's because this earth is spinning in a clockwise direction and this one's spinning in a counterclockwise direction. Uh, they're destructive winds. We talked about the storm surge. The stronger the storm surge, the more damage it's going to cause. It's actually classified uh, by how much damage it caused and that's determined by how much wind it has and they move western westerly in both hemispheres because they're in the trade winds they're in the tropics here are two pictures um, there's a bad side of a hurricane if the hurricane's moving in this direction and spinning in a counterclockwise direction it actually is throwing most of the wind this way um, so the storm surge which is caused by basically the center part of this hurricane um, is intensified on this side and it's actually de-intensified this if you're going to get hit by a hurricane this is the side you want there's still going to be waves coming out of the center of this thing going out in each direction but the wind is going to fight those waves and 
I'm not saying it's going to be good. It's just that if you're in a hurricane, you really want to be on this side and this uh, counterclockwise flow. So category 5, 156 plus mile an hour, um, 20 to 24 foot storm surge. Um, the air that's underneath the volcano or this hurricane is being sucked up and it's like a two, two and a half story building. Category 4, not quite as high. Category 3, not as high wind speed, not as high storm surge. And then we guys will go to tropical storms which can cause three to five foot seas. Um, actually higher sea level and then you throw the wind waves on top of those so it can be actually very destructive. Sea ice versus icebergs. Uh, sea ice is frozen seawater. It's, it's essentially on the ocean. It's already its weight is displacing the water. Um, it's especially important in the Arctic because there's no land under it. Uh, we, we can have ice sheets. You can have what's called pack ice. You can have polar ice. And then you have icebergs, um, which actually are broken off. They can be broken off sea ice. They can also be broken off land ice, um, like glaciers. And these break off and float in the ocean. It's these that actually cause uh, eustatic sea level changes, where we actually increase the temperature uh, temperature of the water, decrease the temperature of the water, but we actually increase the volume of the water. And ice sheets, uh, like in Antarctica, extremely large plate-like icebergs, um, which can actually cause big changes. And what I want them to draw is not this. What I want them to draw, uh, I don't know where it is, so I'll reopen it. This is a shock wave that I actually have up on uh, Fusion. And what we're going to do is we're going to see the difference between ice, sh ice sheets and uh, ice shelf. Uh, so the introduction, they talk about the ice. We're going to look at an ice shelf first. This is ice that's already sitting on the water. And you see they've got a big chunk of water in this aquarium. They've got a nice green water so you can see the level. They've got a level over here to actually see if it changes. So the water level is right there. I'm going to push play and we're going to watch the ice move. And it's actually moving around because as it melts, it has a, like a rocket effect. And if we go back to start and play, watch that water level. The ice that's already displaced the water doesn't change it at all. So the ice that's already sitting on top of the ocean, it can all melt and we will not get a sea rise, sea level rise. Ice sheets are sitting up on top of land. And when they melt, that's going to cause new water. Notice they actually have dropped the level. It's not at the yellow anymore. And they did that for a reason. Let's push play. As the ice melts, the water level rises. So if Antarctica or Greenland ice actually melts, we are going to get a eustatic uh, water change. Where if it actually is sitting on the water like the Arctic ice sheet, that's already on the water. We do not get a eustatic ice change. Okay, and that is, I think, the end of this, uh, let me make sure, because the next time we go into is a greenhouse, so that'll work. 17 minutes, better, not still perfect. Thank you for stopping by.